Is my microphone on? Okay. Hi, my name is Aaron Rapaki. I want to thank Robot Dolan for inviting me here today. This is exciting. Um, one of the reasons why I'm speaking to you today is I care about making robots happen. Well, what does that mean? Well, I have this uh, selfish reason, reason, and I'd like to ask the audience if you have this reason as well. I never want to have to go to a nursing home when I get older. Would, would anyone else like for a personal assistant robot in their home, or maybe your parents' home, that you can stay in your home for as long as possible? Ra raise your hand if you think that would be nice. To, to be able to have independent living. And when we think about what, how science fiction has depicted humanoid robots and perhaps what their purpose could be moving forward, I want that. I want, I want this uh, humanoid robot, this personal caregiver who can help me out and uh, help me maintain my independence. So let's back into this. That might not happen for 50 years. And while well, I'm, I'm in my mid-20s, so this is a good timeline for this project. How, how, do we make, how do I make this happen by the time I need it? How do, we, how do I take the technology, take the community, take the interest in robotics, and I, as one individual in this industry, just try to push things forward? Well, first of all, I had to learn a lot about robotics. My background resides from companies. Um, I've either done internships or worked at iRobot on the Roomba, iRobot on the government side, DECA on, iRobot, uh, um, on the iBot wheelchair. I resided in a human-robot interaction lab for two years. Um, my professional career, I spent a year at AnyBots on Telepresence Robots, a year and a half at Adept on their, uh, the Lynx, the autonomous mobile robot, and now I'm at a startup called Industrial Perception. Large swath of different robot technologies and how to commercialize them. In the midst of this experience, I've learned which decisions are right, which ones are wrong, which robot projects do well, and which ones fail. We're readjusting the slides. Don't worry. Okay, all my text is centered, so it should be okay. And in Silicon Valley, there's a large startup movement, because I, I decided to move from Boston to Silicon Valley to learn how to make robots happen, learn how to make startups happen. And there's um, something called Lean Startups. Have anyone heard of this, Lean Startups, or Steve Blank, the me methodology? So what I hope to convey to you today are some Lean Startup methodologies and some of my own personal recommendations if someone has a new technology or a new idea on how to start a robot company. And the whole point of the Lean Startup methodology is to figure out if you have a bad idea in three months instead of three years. It's about iterating. You can't help having a bad idea. Maybe it doesn't work out, and it was worth trying. But can you iterate, iterate from it in three months or three weeks instead of spending three years on it and then realizing that it's not going to pan out? So this is a common methodology for how to go to market. And I have a different definition of marketing, and I somewhat disagree with this methodology. There's been a time when people have an idea or an invention, they go out and raise money around it, and they'll build up volumes, they'll do design for manufacturing. Then they'll try to figure out where the market is. I think these people want this product, communicate to them, and they realize that they're not going to sell any. Well, here's a better way of doing it. When you take when I, when I think of marketing, it's not the advertising, it's not the evangelizing to a market segment. It's really thinking about who you're selling to. So let's switch these two. And so the lean startup methodology is all about talking to your customer before you spend a lot of money building anything. So when I look at robots, there are companies that start with a good idea. And what's a good idea? A good idea is they see a market problem. Um, I like the, the spoon, like uh, having the problem of how someone can feed themselves. Like, I think that's a great example of, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. How do we create this? But often, my goal, my goal is to push the state of robotics technology, and so we have a lot of technology in research, and we start with the technology, and we try to find the market fit for an existing research project or existing emerging technology. So robotics has a little bit of a problem here, that we're starting off with an invention and not a market problem. So my suggestion, start off with the invention, and then show it to people as quickly as possible. Talk to customers, talk to customers. And it's about you know, who you're selling to. So this talk has three, three overall goals um, to help you figure out which market you should sell to if you have a new product. Where, uh, these are common debates in Silicon Valley. I often uh, 
value, high price, low volume products, and people would want to build toys and sell them by the thousands. I'm scared of that. Um, and also, how can you, um, yeah, what's the most effective way it can mitigate your engineering risk, your support risk, and everything? What, how do you explain this to people? How do you explain this to your market? If you're a robotics researcher, you've been perhaps explaining technical papers and the technology to people your entire career. Is this effective for sales? Is this effective for figuring out what your startup should do? And how? This is the product launch. Uh, I have a little rant about the best way to do a product launch and whether or not to hire PR firms and make it splashy and get all the press. I'm, I'm weary of that because I've seen how that goes. But here, let's start with where. Let's say you have an invention. You're not really sure where to put it yet. Maybe it's a uh, new speech recognition. Maybe it's a new actuator. Maybe it's uh, you have an idea for a product. Maybe it's a uh, vision software or um, a new database or a new sensor, new tactile sensor. And you're thinking, OK, I have this new technology that could be the key patentable component to entering a new market segment and having a company. Oh, and I want to say, don't worry about patents between your actual invention and talking to the market. Talk to customers. Talk to as many people as possible. Because there will be plenty of opportunities to patent between where you figure out your technology fits and aligning that with a specific market you're moving into. Just, and this is what Silicon Valley is all about. We talk to people. We talk to each other. And many ideas come together. So top row, um, where products increase in price. And quantity, do we want um, the high end or the low end? So we can go with, there's three different choices here, high volume, low price. I've, some, a lot of toys are in this area. Um, some of the personal robotics are in this area. A lot of the hobbyist robotics and kits are in this area. And there's pluses and minuses to this. I'm not going to say it's a bad area to go into, but it's not one I prefer, and I'll explain why. Mid volume, mid price, where you're making somewhat lower quantities of robots, and they're maybe slightly higher priced than the market would prefer. It's not dirt cheap. It's not an expendable thing. And this is where I like to go, low volume, high price. Low Start with low quantities. Be at the, the top right, the, the best you can in technology, and to start with the best technology ever, and find that one customer who really wants to pay for it and use that as a seed and as a stepping stone for an entire organization. I am scared of going here, because what I find is it's often, um, let's see, I'll tell you this. Yes, I'm scared of going here because I find there's like huge trade-offs. It's, it's typically not marketed specifically for a segment that needs it. It tends to be a cool novelty that's priced out of uh, people's price range. And so they'll find some early adopters who say like, hey, this is a cool robot, I'm willing to spend thousands of dollars on it. But usually it's not scalable, and I'm very wary of this. And there's poor market differentiation. There's trade-offs between safety and, and capability. They might have not made it as robust and not made it as useful in order to save on cost, but they didn't go as far as they needed to to save on price. And, and here's, here's the fundamental logic. It's, it's physics. When you have a robot that does something useful, it can move something, it can move around in a space, it can pick up something and put it someplace else, it's going to be heavy, and it's going to be large, and it's going to require safety. It's, um, there's a story of a side-by-side -side telepresence robot study conducted at Google a few years ago, where they had three different telepresence robot companies within Google, and two of them were lighter weight, but then they were also easy to knock over, and one of them was around 100 pounds. And Google would not allow the heavier robot to roam around the halls freely underneath remote control because they were afraid people were going to drive it into walls and crash it and someone might get injured. So there's just a split between what is safety and what is capability and price point that I think we need to honor and why it's you know, either go high and low volume or low and high volume. So we start off. This is what I, if anyone has read The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, they have the trough of disillusionment between, you know, um, going from, or this is Crossing the Chasm, one of those. Great books. If you haven't read one of them, you should. Uh, but I call this, this mid volume, mid pricing, the trough of value versus capability. It's expensive, but it 
can't do much and it may not be safe and it, there's a safety gap. Sensors and safety sensors and LiDARs are going to cost money. Um, but if you want a robot to do something meaningful and actually interact with the world, it's worth spending the money on it, but really have to find that market niche who wants to buy it. So high volume, low price, I view a higher market risk. If your product launch requires you to sell 10,000 units or tens of thousands of units in a couple of months, and that's the time you learn that there's a defect and you can't support it well, it's going to be tricky. It might cause a lot of problems. Also, um, if it's a lower end toy, I, I've nicknamed this Toyland, um, it might be very easy for other people to copy. And you can patent software behind it. And if it takes off, though, it would be very compelling and very uh, tempting for other people to copy. And that's what you saw with all the Roombas and all the vacuum cleaner knockoffs. Now, why robots trying to buy their competitors? They bought Evolution Robotics for 74 million. That was the other nice acquisition last year. But it's, it's risky from a business perspective. And I don't think this really gets us closer to having that humanoid nurse in my house when I'm 70 or 80 or 90 years old. Um, so, but if there's someone on the team who really understands the market and really has done it before, uh, there could be a huge value in it. But there's also robot companies who have um, tried to market toys and have actively moved out of that industry because uh, the price competition was just too much. So, looking at the chart again, the benefits of low volume, high price, there's higher technical risk. And most, in, most investors say they would rather take on technical risk than market risk. I'm having these conversations right now. There's investors who will call up our customers and ask them, like, would you buy it if it worked? And they say, yay, yeah, we, would, we will buy this if it works. Uh, we've been wanting something to work and do this job for decades. So here's, here's an interesting thing. There are markets out there, perhaps logistics or automation or, or hospitals, they know what their problems are, and they've been looking for solutions to solve it. It's always better to take a new technology, a new emerging technology, and put it on the edge of an existing market where the sale will be a lot simpler. We go into a customer site, and they're like, yes, we want that. Can it work to A, B, and C spec? And we have to go in internally and say, like, OK, could we test this? Could we somehow prove it? The thing about this audience, or this customer base, is they will not believe you if you say it works. So they've been asking people to provide them these solutions for decades. A couple of them know they want a solution, and they've been, the integrators have come to their facility and say, oh, yeah, we can build this for you. And they've been burned over and over again by integrators who couldn't deliver. And so there needs to be a little more behind the organization or behind the technology to prove that you can do it when someone else couldn't. But if you can actually take this new robotics research technology and put it into the, an, the edge of the ex, an existing market and a market that's somewhat tech friendly, the sale will be a lot easier, but you'd have to do a little more legwork on, uh, on making the technology actually add up and actually work. So here, the where, there's a choice. Very, and there are people in Silicon Valley who I've actively debated with over beers on, on various evenings. The same people we re keep re-entering this discussion because they want to build a high volume platform that I just don't think will have the performance it needs to be compelling. And I'm wary, like, no, don't like, pick your market segment, pick your niche and like, make sure you're solving their problem. And when you're solving their problem, you can build it to a certain qu uh, quality standard that can then be adopted by, by other markets as you progress forward in the co company or go low volume, high price, high price. and uh, stay out of the trough. It's either a lightweight, tiny robot that can't lift anything and can't really do much, or it's, it's something big and bad and ugly that you need to think about safety. But people would be willing to pay for it. The what. So here I have a what do you say to customers? What's the best way to explain this? And this might seem like common sense to a lot of business people. You want to explain to the customer how the robot solves their problem. But again, it's, if it's, if it's a, somebody from university or a researcher transitioning into the business world, it's very tempting to explain the what as the technology. And I've seen companies actively like, prevent themselves from being able to raise money or attract customer attention because they couldn't explain why the why customers should care about the technology. I've seen uh, companies stall for years because of this. 
So just a little practice exercise. Um, these are statements from two companies I've worked for, two different ones, on how the, the product statement evolved. So I'm going to have your help on which statement do you think a customer was more likely to react to? Our product has indoor navigation software with new SLAM algorithms capable of fast decision making. Our product gives robots the ability to move from place to place without human intervention and avoids obstacles. Okay. Our product moves blood specimens and supplies between patient rooms and labs within hospitals. Okay, who, who figured out it was three? <laughs> but so, like, none of these statements are necessarily inaccurate. It's just, it's, it's a thought exercise that I've had to walk different robot companies through as taking the, re the, the technology from research into commercialization. W like, what do you say to somebody on the trade show floor? And what's going to get you to a sale a lot more quickly? Here's another one. Our product uses the latest in internet connectivity and controls, enabling remote driving and video conferencing. I guess you can probably guess what I'm talking about. Our product allows you to see what the robot sees, visit other places without travel, and be in two places at once. And, th and these are things we've actually told people over the course of my year working at, well, this one was AnyBots. Our product enables caregivers, doctors, and nurses to visit patients in need of special care or device. Again, none of them are inaccurate, but one of them has a lot more punch when speaking to a customer. Of course, you need to figure out what that last line is, the where, but that's why I talk to customers and eventually Hopefully, a customer will say, hey, I can use this for this reason, and it's worth exploring that and seeing if that market is big enough or large enough. And if it's not, pivot. And that's the term that Steve Blank and the Lean Startup people use in Silicon Valley. It's not a failed startup. It's not uh, that you're moving on to something new and nothing worked out. It's called a pivot. It happens. Pivot as quickly as possible. And explain to investors that you will pivot. Um, so. So what starts, where you want to, I was watching some Apple presentation that had this set up as a bullseye with the how as the largest circle, the what as the inner circle, but the why. The why is that seed, like why are we doing this? And a lot of great companies start with the why, and then you know they solve their problem and things are great. A lot of robotics companies are starting with the what, the technology. And that's okay, but you need to start with the what, go in and figure out what the why is and re-expand to fill in all the gaps. And time and time again, at every company I've worked at, we'd start with a what, make our best hypotheses about what the market wants. Sometimes I've, I've described it as pushing our art on people. <laughs> we're artists, we're the roboticists, we know exactly what we're doing. And we, go, we went too far along in our manufacturing process. We built too many robots before realizing why people wanted to use them. And then the design was inflexible and millions of dollars were invested. And we're stuck with this product nobody wants. But if we just iterated sooner, if we showed people one robot, instead of asked them if they wanted to buy the 20 we had available, uh, we would have figured out the accessories and the software additions and everything else they would have, they would have uh, been happy with. So my last how, this is my little rant on product launches, and I'm going to try a little fire metaphor here. So what if you're, the flame is profit potential? The logs are uh, the customer decision makers who you need to attack and who you need to uh, convince. And um, I like gasoline, so we know we can maybe fuel this fire a little bit and call this our direct marketing costs. So this is honestly how I see the high volume, low price market, um, a, a small household robot, and I'm scared of it. Great big fire, great big prof profit potential. It could go really well, but what if the wood is wet? And uh, it's just, yeah, what if the wood is wet? What if there's a defect? There's just too many people to talk to. It'll be a little bit difficult. Uh, who here hikes or backpacks or gets out into the woods? OK, I'm, this, I'm a survivalist. I like this. Uh, take one decision maker. You have wet wood. You have a single match. And really cultivate everything. But you can make this fire grow over time, and you knew you started with the right fuel, and you don't need a whole lot in direct marketing costs. It's a conversation here and a conversation there. So in summary, let's see, I had a summary here. So my hopes, my hopes for this industry is I believe it takes product in order to make robots happen. We've seen a lot of research. We have a lot of research papers, and research has its place, and it's really, really, really important. 
But in the US, we have this problem where taking that, commercializing it, and making it product is, is difficult because not enough people are really focusing on the market opportunities. But it'll take landing in a market opportunity in one place to build off itself and build off itself and build off itself. And ultimately, we'll have the indoor navigation, the 3D vision, the software add-ons, and uh, the communication and the internet connectivity that, and the, me and the me mechanisms it'll take. And maybe this will come down to a low price point. It'll take to build that nursing robot. And I just want to leave you with, we all love robots. Many of us love robots. I think in order to make robots happen, we need to love our customers more than we love our robots right now. But we will see this activity become very fruitful and very uh, prosperous in the future. So. Thank you very much.